three-dimensional exhibits. Let's be perfectly clear about that first principle. Two-dimensional selling exhibits are useful. Charts and diagrams, portfolios, sales manuals, pictures, all have value, but by themselves, they lack visual boom. They lack wow. For instance, toy salesman Fussy, in just a minute, will try to sell department store buyer Murphy a new airplane for the Christmas trade. When he does, watch the effect of Fussy's charts, diagrams, and pictures on the buyer. Now, this new toy airplane is a hot number, Mr. Murphy. You see, it works by static electricity. Look at the diagrams here. You see, when you rub this stick, picture A, a few times with this friction cloth, picture B, you produce in the stick a charge of positive static. Positive then, static? Uh, what's that? Yeah, well, uh, you know, uh, electricity. And then when you touch this little tinfoil airplane, picture C, with a stick, picture A, you produce in the airplane a negative charge of static. And that, static? Yeah, you know, static. And then you can keep the airplane up in the air just by keeping the stick on it, as we show here in diagram D. You see? Now, just by looking at Mr. Murphy's face, you can tell he isn't inclined to buy. Watch what happens when Bussy trots out a three-dimensional exhibit. Now let's take a look at the actual item itself, Mr. Murphy. Now watch. First, I take this stick and I rub it to produce a positive charge of static, like that, see? And I take the little airplane, do it up in the air, touch it once. There, I can keep it going around for a long time with that charge of static. Ain't that a honey? Say, that is a honey. Let me play with it a while. Oh, let me try it, Mr. Murphy. It looks like such fun. Now, go away, Nellie. Go oh, away. please, let me have Look it. Look out, Nellie. Look out, now. <laughs> Say, that's swell. That's swell. What kind of deliveries can you make on that item? Why, there's just no doubt about it. A three-dimensional selling exhibit packs a wallop which a two-dimensional chart, diagram, or sales manual never can hope to have. But now, what if you're selling not a toy airplane, but some product too heavy to take along with you to your prospect's office? Suppose, for example, you're selling this big motor designed for use in a factory. Well, you wouldn't want to take that along with you, would you? Now, when you can't show your entire product, there's something you can do. You can show a part of your product and then make the part dramatize the whole. Watch how that principle is applied by motor salesman Bussy. Here, Mr. Cooper. Here you see one reason why our motor will give you more mileage. That resilient felt washer is one of the important refinements of our sealed sleeve bearing. You see, Mr. Cooper, when the motor shaft travels at a high rate of speed, that felt washer fits the shaft so snugly that even oil vapor can't escape. And of course, that makes for perfect lubrication. And perfect lubrication means more motor mileage. That felt washer, Mr. Cooper, gives you some idea of the care with which the whole motor is built. Making a part dramatize the whole is necessary when you're selling a product like this. But even when you can bring your whole product with you to the scene of action, it still is frequently desirable to make a part dramatize the whole, as battery salesman Fussy is about to prove. You cannot tell from the outside of this battery, Mr. Duff, the ruggedness and reserve strength we have built into it. Take, for example, such a detail as the cell connector. Here, look at it. Heavy, full-size, solid lead construction. Now, here's the ordinary cell connector you'd find on most batteries. Can't tell the difference, can you? But they've chiseled on lead on the underside, and that means loss of power, particularly at high rates of discharge but not our connector. No, sir. The kind of connector we make will carry the heaviest loads with minimum loss of power. And that's just typical, Mr. Duff, of the way we build the whole job. 
you now know two ways to vitalize your selling seamanship with three-dimensional exhibits. Show the product itself, show some part of the product. Now there's still a third way. Show some piece of scenery, some stage property, which dramatizes an advantage of the product. That apple is used as a stage property by a crack door-to-door -door salesman who sells floor waxing equipment. Now, madam, watch what happens when I rub this apple on my sleeve. See? Like a mirror, isn't it? So shiny you can see your face in it. That's because nature was wise enough to provide every apple with a protective covering of wax. Wax, the protective covering your floor should have, madam. That simple stage property helps a floor waxer salesman sell. And the apple does double duty too. When he's through using it at the end of a morning as a stage property, he eats it for lunch. Now, take another case of stage property seamanship. Well, I don't know, Bessie. That's quite a price hurdle to pass on to my customers. Why should your vitamin products cost nearly 10% more than your competitors? Why should our vitamin products cost more? Why, because of their increased potency, Mr. Mertz. Increased potency? Well, I can't see that. Well, perhaps we can let you see it. Do you have an electric outlet handy? Oh, yes. There's one right under the counter there. Fine. Now, I know that you can't actually see the increased potency of our product, Mr. Mertz. But if you could see it in terms of light units, here is how it would look. Our competitor's product mm -hmm. and our product. Yeah. Now, don't get the idea that in order to use stage property seamanship, you have to carry around with you a, a big trunk full of complicated props. Nothing of the sort. The simpler your stage property, the better. A successful salesman of lighting equipment, for example, uses this ordinary piece of wire. Usually, this chap sells to school boards. So let's make believe you're a school board and I'm the lighting salesman. Ladies and gentlemen of the board, I hold here in my hand an ordinary piece of good thick wire. When I subject this wire to moderate pressure for a short period of time, as soon as I stop the pressure, the wire springs right back to normal. But when I subject this same wire to more severe pressure for a longer period of time, the wire no longer springs back. It remains permanently bent, and the eyes of a child, unfortunately, are like that wire. We cannot risk, can we, permanently bending the eyesight of our children. We must give them the protection of scientifically correct lighting. And how that simple piece of bent wire impresses a school board. Well, let's summarize principle number one. In order to vitalize your selling seamanship with three-dimensional exhibits, do three things. Show the product itself, show a part of the product, or show some stage property which dramatizes an advantage of the product. Now, let's go to principle number two. Magnetize your seamanship with curiosity. Curiosity is a powerful magnet. In your next sales presentation, use that magnet to help hold the eyes of your customer. For example, watch how principle number two is applied by caramel salesman, Bussy. The grocer Bussy happens to be calling on is a very busy guy, but not too busy to be curious.
Did you see what I just did to those caramels, Mr. Carpus? Yeah, I saw it. Well, then, here's something you'll be curious about. Look, even though I weigh 150 pounds, I didn't break the wrapping on that caramel. That's the kind of paper we use. Now, here's something else. As I open this up, in spite of the pressure I just put on it, there isn't anything sticky about it. That's the kind of wax we use on our paper. Now, one thing more. Smell how fresh that is. Tastes good, too. Fussy made that caramel sales presentation seaworthy because he used curiosity as an eye magnet. Now, meet another salesman who uses that same principle. Cracker salesman, Carmody. As it happens, Mr. Carpus is busier than before. Mr. Carpus. No use, Mr. Carmody. Can't talk crackers today. Well, will you sell me a package anyway? Yes, of course I'll sell you a package. Well, thanks, that's fine. Thank you. What are you looking at? Here, Mr. Carpus. You look. Once again, busy Mr. Carpus is not too busy to be curious. Okay, Carmody, now give him that sales story about cracker, air spaces, and flakiness. There's just no doubt about it. A little curiosity magnetizes a prospect's eyes like nothing else does. If you'd like to see one more rather unusual illustration of that principle. Meet Mrs. Oscar Johnson, a prospect of refrigerator salesman Fussy. Mrs. Johnson doesn't know it yet, but even though she despises salesmen, curiosity will make her welcome salesman Fussy when he arrives. Yes. You please put this egg in your refrigerator. Why, well, I... The I, egg will be called for. But I... I... Uh. And so, into Mrs. Johnson's Model T refrigerator went the egg. The next morning, you know who it is that rings the bell. Was an egg left here yesterday? Yes, I put it in my icebox. May I see it, please? You certainly may. There it is. Mm -hmm. Will you please tell me what this is all about? It's about safe food temperatures. Your icebox, Mrs. Johnson, is the tenth icebox in this neighborhood we've tested with a sample egg. And I'm sorry to say that this egg is not safely cold. It isn't? No, ma'am. Won't you sit down? Thank you. And so, thanks to curiosity, Bussy is safely launched in his sales presentation. Now, of course, in your particular sales work, you might, you might want to use a more conservative, a more dignified appeal to curiosity. Or, on the other hand, you might want to use an even livelier appeal. An appeal spiced, perhaps, with a little humor. One can milk salesman I know uses this trick can. Mr. Grocer, he says, our milk is so fresh it still moves. Just a little humorous monkey business, of course. But it arouses curiosity and curiosity 
magnetizes eyes. Now, let's go to principle number three. Dramatize your seamanship with tests. You know, the simplest kind of a test always rivets interest. Will this fountain pen break when I drop it on the desk? Will this cigar lighter light six times in succession? It won't, but anyway, your prospect is interested in the outcome of such a test. It's like a prize fight. Who's going to win? The fountain pen or the desk? Light or darkness? One round Riley or Slugger McGurk? In the case of automatic stoker salesman Bussy, the question becomes, who's going to win the hammer or the frying pan? Every part of our automatic coal stoker is made literally to last forever. For instance, take any part. Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Take part 45. Part 45 doesn't move. It isn't subject to stress or strain. We could almost make part 45 out of cardboard. But do you know what we make it out of? No. We make it out of steel, not cast iron, steel. But just why should steel be so much better than cast iron? Well, you can figure that out from your own experience, Mrs. Jones. You've uh, cooked using a cast iron frying pan, haven't you? Yes. Well, then you know you have to be very careful, because if you bump it or drop it, the cast iron frying pan will break. Oh. Here, let's, let's make a test. Let's make a test right here. Put this newspaper on the floor. Here's a cast iron frying pan and a hammer. Now watch. There you are. Now. You watch me try to break this steel frying pan. <laughs> See? No matter how hard I strike it, I just can't break it. Well, that gives you a rough idea, Mrs. Jones. Part 45, the one we could make with cast iron, we make out of steel. By that time, Mrs. Jones has decided she's going to buy Bussy Stoker just to get part 45. In your next sales presentation, you use that principle. Dramatize your selling point with a test. And if you want to do a particularly good job of testing, don't do it yourself. Apply principle number four. George do it. That must sound like strange advice to give a salesman. Let George do it. But it's winning advice when George happens to be George Prospect. Doing a test yourself is good, but letting George do it is always better. For instance, watch Ray Hobson sell a healthy order of shatterproof plate glass by letting George Prospect do it. Why don't you take a look at the edge of this uh, glass, Mr. Morgan? Now, I know it's hard to believe that this plate glass will not shatter. Seems almost contrary to nature, but let's try it, huh? How? You mean you want me to... Uh... <laughs> I mean, if you're like I am, ever since you've been a boy, you've had a secret ambition to throw a baseball through a plate glass window. And here's your chance. Take that baseball, Throw it at that plate glass just as hard as you can. You really mean that you want me to? Sure I do. Rip it off and throw it just as hard as you can. <laughs> Getting back to the old days, eh? <laughs> There's your proof, Mr. Morgan. Our shatterproof glass really is shatterproof, isn't it? That simple principle, let George do it, is worth its weight in gold to every salesman in America. When George does it, 
He knows it isn't a case of the hand being quicker than the eye. He knows the test isn't a phony. Now, let's take one more case of letting George do it. Salesman Fussy is now selling voice writing equipment. At the present moment, his job is the demonstration of a new desk ediphone, which his company has just brought out. Here's the new model, Mr. George. It speaks for itself. See how light it is. It is light, isn't it? Now to move that around on your desk, you just raise the front end and then push or pull. Well, there must be rollers on the back of that. Well, that's clever. And when the front end is set down, it acts like a brake. So the machine can't move accidentally. Try pushing that now. It does stay put, doesn't it? And another thing. In order to make this a compact job, and I mean compact, we invented a removable receiver. And the whole thing lifts off with one simple movement. Try it. Like this? Yes. Yeah. Now, stow it away in your drawer here. And close the cover. Does look attractive on my desk, doesn't it? And very compact. Did you notice, Mr. George, that it doesn't take up as much space as a letterhead? Right. And it isn't much higher than the telephone. So, in your next sales presentation, if you want to make good and sure the eyes have it, do what Fussy just did. Don't do the demonstrating yourself. Let George do it. Let your prospect move the machine. Let your prospect close the cover. Let your prospect detach the receiver. Let George do it. Now, as Fussy goes on with this demonstration, he applies one more important principle of selling seamanship. Use your prospect's props. Do you remember a while back how the lighting salesman brought with him a stage property wire? How the floor waxing salesman brought with him a stage property apple? Well, stage properties which a salesman brings with him to the scene of action are never as effective as those he finds on the scene of action. Wherever possible, use your prospect's props. Like Fussy is about to do, after having explained to Mr. George how to use his voice writer. <laughs> now, Mr. George, with this desk at a phone right under your nose, you can save time in a dozen ways. Take, for instance, this incoming mail. When you answer a letter now, with this voice writer smack in front of you, you can answer it immediately. No waiting for your secretary to answer a buzz or come back from some errand she's running for you. You say what you think when you think it, and as fast as you can dictate it, rather than as fast as your secretary can take dictation. Mm -hmm. Those telephones suggest another way you can save time. When you get a telephone call, often it's about an important matter you ought to record accurately and at once or about a matter requiring immediate instructions. Now, with this voice writer so conveniently placed, you don't waste a second doing that recording or issuing those necessary instructions. You say what you think when you think it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Take those trade journals over there. When you get time to run through them, I'll wager that frequently you find an item that gives you a good idea, don't you? Yes, I do. And with your edophone right in front of you, you can nail that idea down before it escapes you. You say what you think when you think it. That timetable suggests to me that maybe you do some traveling for your company. Yes, quite a little. And your secretary buys your tickets for you? Well, she usually does. Well, when she's out on an errand like that, you're still not hamstrung. <laughs> you can still say what you think when yeah. you think it. That buzzer suggests to me another way you can save time. Suppose you suddenly remember that, by golly, you've got to notify the members of the committee to attend a meeting next Saturday. Well, which is faster? To voice write that memo the second you think of it, 
or buzz for your secretary and dictate the memo after she arrives. Miss Peters is very much on the job. Let's make a test. You ring for your secretary and then reach for the voice writer. Let's make a race of it. All right. Miss Peters, notify every member of the coordination committee. We're going to have a meeting Saturday at 10 a.m. Sorry, Mr. George, I was talking on the phone. Miss Peters, notify every member of the coordination... Mr. George. Hey? Eh? You've already told her. What? Miss Peters, notify every member of the coordination committee. We're going to have a meeting Saturday at 10 a.m. Why, Mr. George... That's wonderful. It's like talking to Miss Peters personally. And you can talk to her without interrupting the work she is doing for you. Mm -hmm. You say what you think when you think. Mm -hmm. And so, Fussy uses even Miss Peters as a prop. Now, if you want to make your next sales presentation seaworthy, try that fifth principle. If at all possible, use your prospect props. Well, let's summarize. The eyes are more than the windows to the soul. The eyes are also the windows to the sale. To go through those windows, do five things. Use three-dimensional props. Use curiosity. Use tests. Use George as your tester. Use your prospect's props. Make sure you do all five of those things. Because in the field of selling, remember, the eyes have it. century turned the halfway mark, the world found in its midst a husky young continental upstart, the United States of America. We were not yet a century old, just babes in the international scheme of things, but already we had calluses on our hands and hair on our chest. We were big and tough and growing in four directions. Men and mules and wagons traveled west in search of gold and land. To the north lay the vast Alaska territories, soon to come under our wing. In the south there was gold of another kind, white gold, cotton for the markets of the world. The east was spawning a huge merchant fleet, was rivaling London as a money center, and was soon to become the warehouse of our export products. We were rough and rich and getting fat as geese. Our soil could grow most anything, our climate practically perfect. We had mineral deposits beyond belief. The Comstock load came in and revealed additional millions in silver and gold. We poked a hole in a Pennsylvania mountain and tapped an ever-flowing stream of oil. We laid a cable in the Atlantic for communication east 
and from St. Joe, Missouri to Sacramento, California, rode the famous Pony Express to take care of the West. We fought a war amongst ourselves. Both sides lost, so we shook hands, made up, and went back to work. Our trading posts became busy little towns, and our busy little towns became great swarming cities. The war's reaction set in, and we faced a bleak Black Friday as our financial springs creaked and Wall Street wobbled. But we could take it. And in the same year, we accelerated commerce by completing our first transcontinental railroad, a man-sized job done the hard way. The wind-blown gateway to the west, hard-boiled Chicago, was gutted by fire and burned to the ground. But we rebuilt it, and a few years later celebrated long and loud the hundredth year of our freedom. We had arrived at a curious stage in our development. We had youth, ambition, and freedom. We had manpower, two oceans, great rivers, fish, game, land, timber, and our hills were bursting with ore. We were potentially the greatest nation on the face of the earth, but only potentially for we needed one thing, power. Not the power to conquer other lands, but the power to convert and utilize the vast resources of our own. We had advanced on many fronts, yet we still lighted our way with oil. We expanded far and wide, yet traveled mostly on foot or by horse. The woman in the home provided her own power and knew precious little of luxury and creature comforts. To maintain our forward impetus, we needed a vital force, power, and just when we needed it most, a man of the people came forward and gave it to us. His name was... Thomas Edison is best known, and rightly so, for freeing the world from the shackles of darkness with his electric light. But he went far, far beyond even that heroic venture. He gave the world the electric power which today vitalizes the forces of progress. He led the attack which made nature the servant rather than the master of men. And in his original library at West Orange, New Jersey, and at Henry Ford's memorial to him at Greenfield Village, the new generation sees visible evidence of his many services to humanity. The early models of Edison's dynamos were unprepossessing objects, but they changed the tide of civilization for upon them are based all the huge electric giants which generate the energy of modern industry. Edison brought not only light, but music and laughter into the home with the phonograph. He created the component parts of what resulted in radio. Note the similarity of his microphone to today's. His effect lamp is still the basis for the heart of radio, the tubes. He relieved the tedium of laborious domestic hours with his electric motor, utilized in home electric appliances. He conceived the systems of wireless telegraphy, enabling ships at sea to contact stations on shore. Our methods of communication were practically primitive until the work and genius of Edison, along with that of Bell, made the telephone a commercial possibility. The Edison storage battery resulted in a life and labor-saving unit used today in beacons for planes high above the earth, eyes for miners way beneath it, in safety signals, fire alarms, and marine lighting and power. Mr. Edison's favorite credo appeared everywhere, in this pleasant room where he did much of his work with his charming wife as his best friend and severest critic, in his chemical laboratory, which is still preserved, the scene of countless conquests over nature, and in his machine shop, where he labored with his faithful assistants to bring forth such history-making creations as the universal stop ticker, automatic telegraph systems, the edaphone, sockets, fuses, switches, meters, plate glass, the mimeograph machine, synthetic carbolic acid and benzol, the improved typewriter, electric locomotion, and countless other innovations crystallized from 1,200 patents granted the great man. The present-day colossus of entertainment, motion pictures, is another brainchild of the gifted inventor, conceived by Edison with simple cameras like these. 
he created two of the world's first movie stage, which revolved to capture the rays of the sun. And through his original projectors, Edison presented the first silent epic, The Great Train Robbery, a rough and ready saga, jam-packed with action. It is said that when the valiant heart of Thomas Edison stopped beating, that of the old clock in his library stopped at the same moment, 327. But the heartbeat of his great work has never stopped. It is timeless, providing constant inspiration to the youth of all lands, in whose hands rests the responsibility for future benefactions for mankind. Thomas Edison came into a world without light, without power, without the industrial wherewithal for a full and rich sustenance. He left behind him a greater, finer world, infinitely enriched by the products of his fertile mind. Today, wherever there's light and an ease in living, wherever there's power and force and progress, wherever the smoke of industry reaches skyward, there too is the spirit of Thomas Alva Edison, servant of mankind. Thomas Alva Edison goes principal credit for the development of motion pictures. This weird contraption, built to his specifications at a cost of $637 and popularly known as the Black Mariah, was the first movie studio. For two years or more, the pictures filmed by Edison and other experimenters were shown in viewing machines. Here's an early model. You want a peek? Okay, the reels of progress are spinning. And here is the super colossal Grandpa saw after he'd paid his nickel. People didn't care how they squandered money in those pre-income tax days. This is the original Edison kinetoscope, in which the audience, one at a time, viewed the picture through a peephole. Like this. The kinetoscope was a national sensation, but its inventor thought so little of it that he refused to pay $147 for European patents. Here's still another novel device, interesting not only for its design, but because of the subject matter shown. These scenes, filmed at a reception for Edison, were in all probability the first newsreel. Movie makers, despite the crudeness of early day equipment, were quick to realize the importance of recording historic events. With the opening of this first movie theater in April 1894, pictures were projected by then, the new industry was well underway. In that same year, May Irwin and John Rice exchanged the first green kiss. The scene was promptly suppressed when many clergymen denounced it as a menace to morals. Newsreels still topped every program. Here's New York's famous 69th Regiment en route to Cuba in 1898. Scenes of the funeral of England's King Edward were exhibited internationally. By then, movies had assumed worldwide importance. So, of course, had feminine fashion. New York's Easter Parade became an annual must with newsreel producers. And as pictures with plots came into their own, John Bunny, the first of a long line of screen comedy kings, became a must with everyone who liked to laugh. He and his angular teammate, Flora Finch, were the first international stars. This lady who's being driven batty by the ardor of her lover is Clara Kimball Young, and the nervous Romeo is Sidney Drew. After initial success in comedy, Clara became one of the great dramatic stars of the World War I era. The man on the right was the first matinee idol, Maurice Costello, father of Dolores and Helene. He still plays occasional screen roles. 
The genius of D.W. Griffith, seen here directing an early day chorus, brought movies recognition as an art medium. Three of Griffith's brightest stars were Bobby Harron, Lillian Gish, and that's right, Lionel Barrymore. Lionel, still a favorite, started his screen career when motion pictures were still ridiculed by most stage actors. In 1908, American audiences took to their hearts a 15-year-old who, as Mary Pickford, was destined to become a screen immortal. You see her here in Mender of the Net, produced by D.W. Griffith. Aha, the hero, Harry Carey. Just in the nick of time, too. There, you villain, take that, and that. As a heavy lover, it looks like this guy is a complete flop. Now, while Two-Gun Harry consoles Blanche Sweet, we'll conjure up another of yesterday's best-loved stars, Mabel Norman. As the queen of movie comedy, her profile was as well-known as John Barrymore's. On the screen, Mabel was so funny, everyone laughed at her. Off screen, she was so witty, everyone laughed with her. Most famous of the early day Western stars was William S. Hart. No one ever foreclosed a mortgage on Little Nell's ranch while he was there to protect her. Hollywood beauties spent much of their time on railroad tracks. Aha, the juggernaut with Ford Sterling in the driver's seat. And here, speeding to the rescue, come Max Sennett and the famous racing driver, Barney Oldfield. Sennett abandoned acting to become the dean of comedy producers and made a fortune by tickling America's funny bone. This Romeo, some 25 years ago, was one of Hollywood's most dashing young men about town. His name? Come now, you know that map. He's Wallace Beery. Harold Lloyd, a four-star laugh dispenser, the moment he combined an air of befuddlement and a pair of horn-rimmed glasses, was the first comedian to make feature-length pictures. This is a scene from Welcome Danger. Speaking of firsts, here's one of the first great glamour stars, Gloria Swanson. The latest in cars and the latest in clothes. Other women gasped when Gloria paraded the boulevard. Leatrice Joy, a top flight star in the 20s, and her director, Cecil B. DeMille. DeMille specialized then, as he does today, in pictures made on gigantic scale. After looking at his first spectacle, press agents seized upon the word colossal. About 1920, Agnes Ayres met a sheik named Rudolph Valentino, and the picture that resulted made movie history. Valentino was the first and the greatest of the screen's Latin lovers. No other star has ever been so idolized by women fans. In 1927, a rapidly maturing movie industry gave the world seventh heaven, and the stars of that picture, Janet Gaynor and Charles Farrell, skyrocketed to worldwide fame. In that same year, The Jazz Singer was produced, starring Al Jolson, already famous on the Broadway stage. It caused a revolutionary change in movie making. Within a year, every studio was rushing the production of talkies. The screen had found its voice. Here's Mae Robeson in a scene from an early talking picture. Hey, scat! Good idea. Did you find any other place to sleep on but my picture? John Barrymore and Carol Lombard. What do you want, scorpion? If it makes you any happier to call me names, go ahead. Oscar, you're complete. The most horrible excuse for a human being that ever walked on two legs. You've always misunderstood me, Lily. We almost forgot an old pal, one of the greatest stars of them all, Mickey Mouse. This is a scene from his first talking picture, Steamboat Willie. with this scene from the first cartoon, made by painting the characters on pieces of glass and moving the drawings by hand. With the birth of talking pictures, a host of great new stars rose to fame. Among them, Cary Grant and Rosalind Russell, his teammate in some of the most hilarious comedies ever filmed. Edward G. Robinson, Irene Dunn, 
Humphrey Bogart, Gene Arthur, Fred Astaire, Rita Hayworth, James Stewart, Eddie Lamar. Yes, fans, your movies have grown phenomenally since their birth 50 years ago. And their growth in great measure is due to such men as these. Meet some of Hollywood's veteran directors, the men who have made your pictures and discovered and developed your stars. Every one of these directors can show at least 30 years of service in the entertainment of America. Sam Wood, Robert Z. Leonard, Raoul Walsh, Irving Cummings, Richard Wallace, Edward Sutherland, Alfred Green, Edward H. Griffith, George Marshall, William Siter, and Cecil B. DeMille. If movies have brought you pleasure, you owe these men a vote of thanks. Thank you.